and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. I'm Serge. Joining me as always, we have Jer, Alex, and Liam. A reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you, with your support over at the Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. We literally couldn't do it without your support. Let's get to it. Let's start with our opening segment, the best card you're not playing, and up today is me. I want to talk about a little friend, the Ramanap Excavator, um, also known as Crucible with Legs. It is a 2-3 for 2 and a green. Uh, is it a turtle? What kind of creature no, type it's is it? It's, it's a, a naga. naga. It's a naga. It's a snake friend. Snake friend. Yeah, and it has this wonderful line of text that says, you may play lands from your graveyard. And it also has some, uh, some fun little flavor text. This world was once so much more than the confines of an unpronounceable word. It's also a cleric. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag cleric tribal. Doran clerics. Come on. Nak Nak to Moon. Nak to Moon. Ah, of course. So, when this got spoiled, mm -hmm. I think I made like a fire trail running to tell you about. It. <laughs> maybe like, that that was a, maybe that was a fever dream. It's like yeah. I know someone who likes this card. Yeah. So, if you've played a lands deck before, uh, which I have been known to to perhaps <laughs> dabble in this archetype a little bit, being Just, a magic player in our local community who owns a tabernacle. Uh, the I uh, guess the tabernacle is. Uh, so, Ramanab Excavator is is the creature-based version of Crucible of Worlds, a three-mana artifact that does the same thing. You may play land cards from your graveyard. Um, it, being a creature, has uh, uh, an upside and a downside. The upside is you can swing with it. The downside, it dies to wrath. Um, yes. The other upside is you can green Sun Zenith for it. Ooh, yeah. Well, why are you playing this card? It's much easier to tutor for in green... Um, you have all the creature tutors to find for it, which is fantastic. It gives you a second copy of Crucible in a deck that cares about that. Um, and in an interesting way, it lets you play a Crucible effect in a deck that normally wouldn't want to play Crucible. And that's where it's really powerful. So if you're sort of playing an incidental wasteland, or you want to get more value out of your fetch lands, or if you're playing something like Horizon Canopy, and you want to recur that over and over and over, this card just gives you a ton of utility while occupying a fairly competitive spot in your deck, like three drops isn't up there. Uh, Jerry, you were playing like a, a three-color mid-range sort of lands deck, and you were playing it as well. Yeah, yeah, it's really good in that deck. Uh, it's it's better as a fair card than Crucible of Worlds, because as you say, it has, like, just having a body keep, makes it have just that much more utility. It blocks than it attacks. Yeah, it has legs. The three toughness is well, pretty snake. real. Yeah. yeah, and and just so the fact, at, like, also you can tutor for it, but mostly just the fact that it's a creature lets you play it in more decks, as you were saying. Totally. I think it's really underrepresented right now. I think it's a really yeah. strong card, and a lot of decks are playing Wasteland just because, and that will tie in nicely into our episode today. So I think mm -hmm. it's, I think it uh, will find a home in more decks than you'd think. That is my suggestion for what's, today. What's the dankest thing you get back from this guy? Strip mine. If you're not nope. putting in points, it's kind of tough. Horizon Canopy is pretty. Horizon pretty tight Canopy, to get back. I think, is I think is the spice. Just like there. draw a card every turn. Okay. Yeah. And if you're in a three color deck and you're just getting Surge. fetch lands, yes. Go with me on this journey. Okay. This guy. Mm hmm. Um, fast bond. I'm with you. <laughs> Tomb of Arami. Oh wait, it's legendary. Yeah, it's also just like you need. Rip. <laughs> so it doesn't sound that powerful. It's we're, so it's so gonna, rad though. We're gonna pay fifteen life to make three five fives, two of which to kill each yeah. other. Yeah, Ura Urami is certainly legendary. What about Cephalid Coliseum? Oh, Cephalid Coliseum is pretty spicy. Uh, so Cephalid Coliseum, a land that lets you draw three and pitch three, or yeah. do you, yeah, if you have Thresh. Uh, yeah. Barbarian Ring. Barbarian Ring's pretty hot. Wait, Tomb of Urami also deals damage to you when you tap it. Oh, yeah. Yes. So you can't even make two of these and have them kill you. you can only no, 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 it doesn't deal damage when you activate its, like, make demon ability. But you have to add the black mana. It's... Oh, I guess you're playing swap. Sorry. It's I, fine. All right, <laughs> all right, it's all right. Yeah, so check out, check out our snake friend because it's awesome. Today's episode is... Oh, <laughs> actually, sorry, Graham wanted to jump oh, in. It's just because you made a joke about the, quote... To Burnicle. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, f I feel like we should that was, explain. That yeah. was my bad. <laughs> I feel like we might uh, want to sorry. explain what we that is. We were talking about Tabernacle the, of Pendril Vale. Vale. Yeah, a Act. very powerful land from Legend Block that uh, hoses creatures. Um, and basically, it's an expensive card, and since I already have one, it's easier for me to play lands, because yeah. this is one of the things that kind of keeps people out of the archetype. It's a legendary land from Legends? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 
That's what I meant and when it I said legend. It doesn't have for mana, but it has the text. All creatures now require an upkeep cost of one in addition to other upkeep costs. If you don't pay it, it's destroyed. So it, it gives all creatures in play an upkeep of one that, generic. That's the real power of the card, is that it's not your trigger to remember, it's theirs. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So if, if they oh, draw their card without paying for their creatures, they're gone. Like, free. Oh, bye. One very fun interaction with this, even though we're going way down the tangent rabbit hole. Do uh, you know what Merit Lodge? A little line of text on Merit Lodge? Indestructible. It says indestructible. Wait, this is a destroy effect? This is a destroy yeah. effect. Tabernacle doesn't say sacrifice, it says destroy. <laughs> so if you're playing a land stack and you're playing Dark Depths and Thespian Stage, and you activate that sweet little interaction to remove all the counters from your Dark Depth, and you give birth to your avatar creature Merit Lodge. Merit Lodge is indestructible. You don't even have to pay for Tabernacle. You okay. get to make a 2020 and just laugh as I they have, like pay one, and you're like, no. I have one last tangent for this <laughs> thought line. Just speaking of weird templating on old cards, Yeah. Um, I believe it's Lurking Night Stalker, which I, is a is card it? from Portal. Okay. I hope it's Lurking Night Stalker. It's one of the Night Stalkers. It's, nope, wrong one. Uh, it's three black black for a 3-2, and okay. when it comes into play, it says, like, you may force your opponent to destroy one of their creatures, but it's errata to you edict them. Weird. Yeah, it's... Uh, Brutal Night Stalker. It's pretty wild. That it's was that, that was a oh, hard find. Predatory Night Stalker. Predatory, predatory Night Stalker, that's the one. Right. It's, there we go. Yeah, the one... It got the, reprinted the, in the printing Vintage in, Masters. It did, the printing in Portal, yeah. I knew I remember When it comes into play from your hand, you may force your opponent to destroy any one of his or her creatures. Your, your opponent chooses. Your opponent chooses the creature. But yeah, this is... Uh, Weird. ...has been errated to an, a sacrifice effect. All also, right. I well, think. Have you, I'm also. so sorry, Serge. Have you seen the Magic Online promo art for Tabernacle? I oh, have no. not. It's have. really pretty. Oh! It's really, really that pretty. That is pretty. The How art's I... pretty, but why did they have to make so much border and I don't know. empty text? Why can't also, we see like more the of the art? Is, well, because it's, it's Magic Online, so the text isn't like relevant. I well, no, the, the text isn't typeset. Like <laughs> yeah. it's it hmm. it varies depending on the size of the card you're viewing it. I guess that's which is true. why it has this really awkward orphan line return. It's pretty, but I I I, I think I just like the OG. All right, may I move on? Yes, you, you may. <laughs> okay. <I'm done. laughs> Today's theme is uh, we're going we're going into more of a how to episode, and today's theme is going to be how to meta game. Uh, so, what is meta game? What is meta gaming? How do you do it in Highlander? Let's throw it over to Jer with uh, an introduction to what meta gaming is. Uh, so, meta gaming is making choices based on what deck you're going to play and what cards you include in your deck based on the popular choices or things you expect to see in the tournament you're going to for that one specific tournament. So when should you metagame? Uh, it, it's especially powerful when you have a pretty good idea of what the tournament is going to look like. Like if there's a really popular deck or if you know all the people in your area really well and they don't have a bunch of decks to choose from. And you just it, want to get them. And you just want to get them. It can be a really powerful tool to help you right. succeed. Now, metagaming is not unique to Highlander. You see it in a lot of competitive magic. You'll, you'll see, you know, what is the standard metagame, modern, legacy, whatever. How is that different in Highlander? Uh, well, in, in Highlander, it varies the most, or differs the most from those formats, mostly because there's no sideboard. So you have to make all your choices main deck. Quite yeah. often you'll see a lot of the biggest metagame choices in those formats uh, in the sideboard. This is especially prevalent in modern when there's so many like hoser cards in the sideboard, like Rest in Peace, Stony Silence, yeah. mm -hmm. those types of cards. And you don't really see those in Highlander because you can't really afford to play them in your main deck. Yeah. Well, like, the, you, can, you can have these cards in your sideboard because they're insane in some matchups mm -hmm. and completely dead in others. Exactly. And so. when they're dead, you just don't bring them in. Well, let's talk about that really quick. We have our last definition before we dive into it, which is what is a hate card? When we talk about that and we, he we hear different terms, hosers, hate cards, silver bullets, what are those? Well, in... When I think of hate cards, I think of them sort of in, in three categories. I think of, like, utility cards that are, like, just pretty good, but not necessarily game-winning. Like, I'd actually consider Remunap Excavator a, a 
a like utility hate card. If you see a lot of white weenie running around, mm -hmm. they're really good at casting Armageddon and Ravages of War. And Ramen Up Excavator is actually a pretty reasonable card Ooh, to have yeah. have in that matchup. It blocks nice. a lot of their two power yeah. creatures. Okay. Uh, other cards I'd consider in this vein are like Kitchen Finks. Nice. You don't always need Kitchen Finks, but it's like really good if the the meta is more aggressive. What's Kitchen Finks? Uh, Kitchen Finks is one and two Selesnia hybrid yeah. for a three two with persists. Persist, which means when it dies, it comes back with a minus one, minus one counter if it didn't have a minus one, minus one counter already. Yeah. And when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life. So if it dies with Persist, it comes back and... Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's really stupid, by the way. Yeah. If you've never played with it, it's actually insane. Yeah, Kitchen the, Finks. Yeah, the, ne the next level is sort of like silver bullet answer, and I'd, I'd uh, quantify this by like Core Firewalker is the one that really stands out mm. to me. Yeah. It's a uh, two white for a two, two and it has protection from red. Whenever a player casts a red spell, you may gain one life. Yeah. If you re resolve this against an aggressive red deck, you're going to win. <laughs> uh, if you resolve Close it against a red control deck, it's really, really hard for them to deal with, and it's going to elongate the game substantially. Um, but there's a bunch of matchups where it's just like pretty anemic, not really going to well, do I a mean, whole it's lot. Just a bear. Like a bad bear. Yeah, which, which you know, isn't a great rate in, in such a powerful format for the same two mana you could be playing Thalia, Guardian of Thraven, yeah. or uh, Stoneforge. Stoneforge, However, totally. it does still pick up GTA. <laughs> Definitely, and, and like that's what I'm saying. And this category is sort of the deepest I'm usually willing to go in Highlander. Okay. There's a third category, which is like Complete Hoser. Okay. And this category is stuff like Choke. Oh, all right, talk about Choke. What's Choke? Choke is... Two and a green for an enchantment, and it reads, Islands don't untap during their controller's <laughs> untap phases. Oh. There's another one, Ow. Boil, which is three and a red for an instant, destroy all islands. Man, what do you have against blue? Uh, it's really good. It's not It's not us, it's Watsy. <laughs> they printed Bra. these cards. Bra. Uh, um. Also, I think the only cards that are like sometimes justifiable to play in this category <laughs> are the ones against blue. Just That's because appropriate. Just, it's just because blue is the most played color. Okay, so and you're, like, you're pretty safe if you put that in, if you want to go that deep. That's the thing, you're still not safe. Like, Where, where do you qualify Pyroblast? Uh, oh. It's sort of in between two and three, and it sort of depends on your deck. Uh, I think if you don't have a lot of deck manipulation and you're a faster deck, it definitely falls into the third category, And at which point I'd just play something more devastating. But if if you have a lot of deck manipulation and like like I've played this card in blue red control before, when uh, blue mirrors were really common and it was it was really good for me. I've also played it in big red where you play cards like Doretti and you play a lot of draw sevens and you play yeah. you just are able to see a lot of your deck, especially against the blue decks. Mm. That like having this card in your deck can be really good and you can sometimes tilt your high tide opponent <laughs> off the face of the earth. So cool. just really quickly, what Pyroblast does is it's a single red instant that says choose one, tar counter target spell if it's blue, or to start destroy target permanent if it's blue. Um, so the other one other nice thing about this card is that you can just cast it. Um, even if you don't have, even if you're not targeting a blue thing, you can still cast the spell. Just but, get that storm count up. Yeah, it won't do anything, but you can get it out of your hand if you need to, so... Is that the difference between this and red elemental block? Yeah. Correct, yeah. Destroy target permanent if, if it's, it's blue. blue. So you can just target it and cast it, and then it'll also be destroyed if it's blue. If not, oh, it just okay, does so nothing. so this one's better. So, yeah. It is, it, and then REB, well, they're better and worse. There's yeah, two pluses and minuses. Different. And then red elemental blast, blaster, REB is destroy target blue permanent, counter target blue spell. It's just yeah. no, very no small change in syntax that mm. makes all the difference. Well, yeah. and these ones look way better. Yeah. Jared <laughs> famously won't play Power Blast because he likes the art on Red Elemental Blast yeah. too That's much. I like that stuff. And, and I have beta Red Blasts and Blue Blasts. Whoa, so. swag. <laughs> all right, well, let's open it up a bit. Jared, thank you for the definitions. Um, so let's talk about sort of the risks and rewards around some of these hate cards when you're metagaming. So I want to talk about Blood Moon at first. So Blood Moon is a archetype defining card, uh, obviously very hated and contentious in modern right now. Uh, it's two and a red for a red enchantment that just says all non-basic lands are mountains. So this card's got to be an auto include in every red deck, right? Mm, no, uh, it, it turns out not. So there's there's a risk reward to playing 
cards like Blood Moon. In a deck where you see a lot of cards, uh, like Blue Moon, for instance, which is yeah. definitely the deck that we see this played the most in Highlander, uh, it's great. You, you definitely do want to include Blood Moon because the reward for playing it is very high when it's good, and the risk in your deck is not that high because you can get rid of it when it's bad. You can brainstorm it away. You're often drawing enough cards. It's not that big a deal. But if you're playing something like Mono Red Goblins, yeah. um, you don't see enough cards to be able to afford to draw Blood Moon in the bad matchups. Hmm. Um, I think that Goblins still often plays Blood Moon, but this is the, an example of uh, a meta card that actually I think gets in and out of the deck depending on what the metagame looks like. I was going to say, I pretty routinely see Blood Moon in, like, all kinds of, like, mono-red, like, mono-red aggressive decks, and sometimes even, like, red X, like, occasionally red-green. Although maybe they want to be playing Magus of the Moon and not Blood Moon. Yeah. So let's talk about Magus of the Moon. That's What's much that? more common. Yeah, so Magus of the Moon is, is two and a red for a 2-2. Two, two. Uh, I think this one's not a cleric, unfortunately. It's a human <laughs> wizard. But it's a human wizard. It's a wizard. Yeah, that says non-basic lands are mountains. So it's the same text. Yeah. Um, so in the creature decks, uh, much like Ramming Up Activator, <coughs> Serge, you have inadvertently introduced our topic perfectly. Uh, like, due to the fact that this creature has legs and is also probably performing in their own uh, David Bowie cover band. <laughs> um, that costume. It's good art. It's sweet art. Uh, you know, he's got the mic. It. It, he's actually just howling like, Ooh. yeah, yeah. Um, the fact that this creature has legs is, or that this card has legs means that the opportunity cost on playing it is much lower. Mm. Whereas you play your Blood Moon or you have your Blood Moon in your hand, it does not do anything. Like Alex said, this carries a GTA, you yeah. know, this can get brute force, this yeah, can it's attack. Like if you were to draw Blood Moon against like a mono white deck, it does absolutely nothing. It yeah. feels so bad. It's, it's horrendous. I play a if lot. You, oh, yeah, if you draw Magus of the Moon against the same deck, you're like, hey, I have a Grey Ogre. It at least blocks. And and it, it Magus of the Moon is much better in the matchups where it like sort of does something. Like in Mono White, they actually have a lot of utility lands. They're playing stuff like Horizon mm -hmm. Canopy. They're playing Mita Vault Mishra's Factory. Caracas. They're playing You're just... Caracas. They're playing Ancient Tomb City of Traders yeah. now. I guess I, I, I meant more that <clears throat> you're not going to completely like blank their, uh, yeah, their that, land base yeah. like you would for like a that's three certainly or four true. deck. And, and that's why I think Magus is better in the mono red decks. They've actually started eschewing Blood Moon from their deck in, entirely. Uh, and even Magus gets in and out. Yeah, like Mono Red is less medic, likely to play these cards too because it's so so efficient at what it does. So here's a sort of a great introductory layer of of a little bit of what metagaming can do. On uh, you can find similar effects that do something back and forth. Another example would be Pithing Needle, which is a one mana artifact that as it enters play, name a card, disable the activated abilities by that card. Versus Phyrexian Revoker, which is a two mana two one creature, which has a very similar effect. No, notably, Pithing Needle doesn't stop mana abilities, and Phyrexian Revoker does. Yeah. yeah. So there's some there's some subtle differences, but the point aside from that is sometimes metagaming is if effect is powerful, how does it add to your strategy? What are you hoping to run into? Do you run it? Do you want the redundancy of two of the effects? Does it help your deck win? Or um, do you want sort of that same effect, but you have to make sure it actually sort of fits with what your game plan is doing? Or it's like, do you want that effect in a way that your deck is able to find? So, for example, yeah. like a um, a blue like a blue based sort of artifact deck would maybe want to want Pithing Needle because it's one mana and you can find it with Trinket Mage. Mm -hmm. Whereas like a creature deck would probably be better with Revoker. It's like you could maybe put this into something that had like Survival or Ella Damry's Call, something like that. Something else you have to consider is what matchups you want it for and how easy mm. they are to remove in the matchup. Yeah. So if you're if you really want to revoke like the Planeswalker out of out of a control deck, uh, or stop stop a Planeswalker out of a control deck, you decided that a Revoker or a Pithing Needle type effect is the best best way to go about it. Uh, you have to think what's more, what's more difficult for them to remove a Phyrexian Revoker or a yeah. Pithing Needle. Yeah. And also, like, can I afford to draw Pithing Needle in that matchup? And will will I have enough pressure anyways? So, so obviously, it's like stuff to think about. So obviously, the reward in a good sideboarding card is you now have an advantage in a matchup. And the risk is if you pick a card and you end up in a bad matchup, you're now stuck with that card. So mm -hmm. the amount of times that I've been playing. Uh, a red-based prison strategy, so Mardu prison, a red-white, you know, you're trying to ramp into Armageddon's or, or uh, wildfires, and you have Blood Moon in hand, and you, you lose the draw, um, or the luck of the dice, and you're sitting across goblins, and you're like, <laughs> I am, my Armageddon's are useless, they're always going to have a better board than I have, this Blood Moon is useless, I now, in my seven-card hand, uh, I only have five cards. 
this is terrible. And right. and again, to reiterate, there's no sideboard in Highlander. Yeah. Um, we tried it once, it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go down that road too much. Um, Jerry, you want to talk a little bit about mulliganing? Uh, yeah, so most people don't consider mulliganing when, when it comes to metagaming, but a, a lot of people, when they, they look at their opening hand, they look in terms of their own game plan, which, which makes a lot of sense. You yeah. need, How do I you win? Need, yeah, lands and spells, does this hand enact the game plan that my deck wants to do? Uh, sometimes people don't consider is the matchup they're in. Say you, say I'm playing against Surge, mm -hmm. and I, I figure he's on some sort of lands deck, and Fair. I have... I can't imagine why you would come to that Fair. conclusion, e but sure. E exactly. And I'm considering keeping a land light hand, and I'm, but, but it's got like, maybe it's got like a mana dork or two, so like maybe I can get there eventually. And Surge looks at his hand and he's got like Fast Bond and Ram and App Excavator and Strip, <laughs> strip Mine. You're know, like, <laughs> and Surge is just like, keep. And then I'm like, yeah, I can probably get there, I'll keep. And then I, I play my land and then Surge Strip Mines me. Yeah, Strip Line, Tabernacle, go. That, that's an extreme <laughs> example, but like, you have to consider the matchup you're in if you know it when you're mulliganing as well. If you've got hate cards, how do you draw them? Well, uh, a, a more concrete example that happened to me, like, on Monday, mm -hmm. was I sat down across from someone who I knew had been playing Storm yeah. recently, and I looked at my opening hand, which was good, had interaction, counterspells, uh, Flash Rector. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, like Jeskai Flash Rector. I like um, it. All right, cool. Yeah, that's deck's kind of sweet. Um, but my, my hand had uh, lands and counterspells, and it had this pesky Terminus. <laughs> Kind of clogging it up, making it a six. But as a six card hand, it was still keepable, especially against Storm. I felt really comfortable keeping it. So I was like, yeah, okay, great. And then my opponent went uh, Mishra's Factory, uh, Mana Crypt, uh, Cast Porcelain Legionnaire. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you thought they were on Storm and they were on Aggro. Oh, they were on Mono White, no. yeah. So, uh, so I lost because I should have mulliganed that hand, A, because it was too slow, B, because it had one of my best cards that needs to be in my deck, Terminus, yeah. in its opening hand. Interesting. Um, That's awkward. That's an aggressive start. Yeah, so it's just, it's it's something you you definitely want to be aware of, and, and you're not always going to know. And, and when you don't know, it's totally fine to just mulligan on the basis of, does this, does this deck, or does this hand enact my deck's game plan? Yeah. But if you do know, it's, it is worth it to uh, look for the cards that you've been willing to put in your deck for that matchup, right? Yeah. You've made sacrifices, presumably cut stuff, uh, to put those cards in your deck. You might as well have them in that matchup. That leads really neatly into something that I wanted to talk about. Sure. Um, this actually came up in a discussion we were having on uh, the Facebook group about this. Like, somebody was asking for, like, you know, what kind of dank outs can I play uh, to deal with Blightsteel Colossus? Can I? Yeah, okay, go on. Um, and there was a bunch of suggestions, but the most helpful one, one is that maybe you shouldn't play that many answers uh, because like every hate card you add in waters down the rest of your deck yeah. for every other matchup. Sometimes you just have to take things as an occupational hazard. It's like there's <clears throat> some cards that I'm just going to lose to. All right, occasionally oh. I take 11 and occasionally I take the I've got, I've, got a fun, I've got a fun way here. I'm going to come up with a situation, and I'm going to sign all three of you a deck, and you Ooh. tell me what cards you put into it. Okay. So, um, you're against, uh, you know there's going to be Reanimator. Okay. Uh, and the question is, how much Graveyard Hate do you bring in? So, Liam, you're on control. How much Graveyard Hate do you bring in? Um... Yeah, it's. I think it's more a question of like what kind of graveyard hate you bring in, mm -hmm. which is dependent on what color control deck I am. So let, let's assume I'm playing blue black control, just yeah. for simplicity's sake. Uh, the kinds of cards I think I would bring in would be uh, maybe I'm more inclined to get Nihil Spellbomb into Ooh, my deck. Yeah. So what does that do? Uh, so Nihil Spellbomb is a one mana artifact that says tap, uh, exile target player's graveyard, and then it also says when Nihil Spellbomb is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay black if you do draw a card. Now, why do you like this in blue-black control? Uh, it cycles, which is really good, and yeah. it, it only hits one graveyard, and I I value my graveyard as a control deck, so I want the one-sided... Because you play Delve Spells. 
Yeah, and I and I just have Snapcaster. I have Jaspers Prodigy, presumably. To run through your whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a lot of reasons to want to keep my graveyard nice and healthy. Okay. But this is a good thing to bring in. I think if I was gonna play Nihil Spellbomb, I would also do things like get Trinket Mage into my deck. Yeah. Um, because I want to increase the amount of times that I can find this card because it is actually um, a little irreplaceable. There's not a whole lot of other good options that only hit one. Graveyard. I have, like, yeah, because I don't want to play Relic of Progenitus. I could play Phyrexian Furnace. Uh, yeah. Phyrexian Furnace is a, is a one mana artifact um, that uh, is similar to Relic you, of Progenitus. You tap it to remove the bottom card of somebody's graveyard, and <laughs> yeah. you can pay one and sack it to remove target card target in card, the graveyard. And you draw a card. But yeah. th this yeah. card's a little more thin for me, and I, I think I wouldn't go this far. Okay. Um, if, there, if I knew. If there were like seven people bringing Reanimator, I would absolutely sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the nice thing about Nihil Spellbomb is that it's so non-committal. You play it on turn one, you cycle it eventually. Yeah. And exiling everyone's graveyard is usually pretty good. But I suppose the other. Oh, go ahead, Graham. Oh, I just, <clears throat> I, forgive me if you've already sort of reminded people of this right now. But of course, this format has no sideboards. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. We yeah. ad nauseum. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. but I mean this this episode. You yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no worries, I'm here. Graham. How's it going? Hey, what up? Great. Hi, Graham. <laughs> so, uh, here's Deer. So, w one other point for the blue black control deck you don't even have to sideboard that hard because you already have answers in counter spells and removal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you play a little bit of something to answer it, but it's neat. So, Alex, your hypothetical one you're a green based mid range deck. What graveyard hate are you playing and uh, why? Well, I'm already playing uh, Scavenging Ooze. Now, why? Because, like, the card is insane on its own. And what does it do? Uh, it's one and a green for a 2-2. Two -two, yeah. And it has an activated ability for one green. Exile target card from a graveyard, so any graveyard. And if it was a creature card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Scavenging Ooze, and you gain one life. So, uh, this card is really, really great in a lot of situations. It's good in aggro because you can eat your own creatures that have died uh, previously. You can eat your opponent's creatures. It gets huge and out of control. And also because it can hit any card, uh, you can just use it to hate out graveyards. So you just leave a, like one or two green up, and then they actually can't play their threat. On the end step? Um, I feel the same way about uh, Deathrite Shaman. Yeah. Which I would play in virtually any <laughs> green or black deck. Virtually. Yeah. <laughs> um, because having access to one or the other ability is good. This is the good old one mana Planeswalker. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's one hybrid Golgari for a 1-2 Elf Shaman with three abilities. First one is tap, exile target land from a graveyard, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. For black and tap, exile target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard, each opponent loses two life. And for green and tap, exile target creature card from a graveyard, you gain two life. So obviously like the nut. Yeah, so you have three hate abilities. <laughs> Well, three abilities that are just good, yeah. and incidentally also hate out your opponent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, if you're playing black, would you play Bajuka Bog, which is a land that taps for black, enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, exile target player's graveyard? Um, if I was in <clears throat> like so, if you're in green black, like black mold, I don't think so, because like if you're aggro, tap lands suck. <laughs> so even though the effect is good. The effect is very good, but this slows me down. What about Loaming Shaman? I have no idea what that guy does. <laughs> it's a 3 mana 3-2 three for 2 and a green that says target player shuffles their graveyard into their deck. Loaming I think Shaman? any number of cards from target huh. player's yeah, graveyard. Yeah, that might be right. This is a creature or a spell? It's a creature. creature. It's a 3 mana 3-2. Three, 3 mana 3-2. Three, yeah. Interesting. There is a really interesting card that, if we're talking about green black, that Nelly used to play in mono black. Yeah. Um, Oh, what was it? it? Weathered Wretch? No, it's black X instant exile X cards from your opponent's graveyard. Uh, they lose that much life and you gain that much life. Oh, yeah. What mm. card is that? It's from like Eldrazi block. I'm sure the, we're going to get name is all kinds of names screamed at us in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's really good because... Is it Plunge into Darkness? No, it's... No, that's the one that... Like tutors and stuff. Um, really but it's it's great because you can just use it as like this fireball. Yep. Against virtually any deck, and also it incidentally hates out um, people. What, what about a card like Death Gorge Scavenger? Quite recent. Oh Ooh. yeah, that could, I like that guy. Yeah. So Death Gorge Scavenger is that a card's uh, really good. Three two for two and a green. Oh. And all these, all these three power creatures yeah. today. Anyways, whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may exile target card in a graveyard. If a creature card is exiled this way, you gain two life. If a non-creature card is exiled this way, it gets plus one, this plus one until end of turn. This card is great because it has an effect immediately, 
and then <clears throat> on subsequent turns. Yeah. Are you thinking of Suffer the Past? That's the one. Ooh. Uh, Suffer the Past. It's from Rise of Yeah, cool. this, I think this card's sweet. I haven't played it in ages, but I like it. Card's so, neat. So last question, we're going to throw Jer one. So Jer, mm -hmm. you're going up against Reanimator. Yeah. You're on burn. How much Graveyard Hate are you bringing? None. Why? Uh, burn is a deck, as Liam mentioned before, that y you you really don't want to elongate the game. You're looking for to win the game with your first 11 or 12 cards that you see, so by turn 4 or 5. And if one of those cards, like, already if you draw too many lands in that, that point, you've probably lost. Uh, especially against Reanimator, they have so many good ways to just win the game on the spot. If they get Iona into play, you lose. If you get Imperial Archangel into play, you lose. If they get a big Life Linker into play, you probably can't win. Uh, I'm noticing a theme. <laughs> Sphinx of the Steel Wind. Um, yeah, that, that, so, that's just game over. <laughs> so it's already a rough matchup, and you just have to try to be as fast as possible. Diluting your strategy, trying to disrupt them, just isn't yeah. isn't I mean, worthwhile. Your, your, your board choices are more lightning bolts. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that Gotta go a, fast. That's an important point, though, is that sometimes the correct meta move is not to make any changes at all. It is to really refine your strategy to just win before your opponent gets to execute. Yeah, sometimes you just have to be on the hope I don't play this person plan. That's that sometimes is correct. Yeah. Like sometimes it feels I mean, like you wanna you wanna change stuff up, but Yeah, you could potentially cut even like the incidental hate cards to add more speed to your deck. Like I'm talking stuff like um uh Ferocidon or uh um Harsh Mentor. But you probably don't need to cut those guys, but it's Ferocidon is really good in that matchup because one of the ways they beat you is by getting a huge life linker into play. So sometimes saying right. the text no. players I can't gain life the rest of the text. Lets, lets you win. It has menace too. Yeah, this card is so dumb. Why Rampaging does it have menace? It's so and good. Another three drops. At least it doesn't draw. I was I was gonna say some <laughs> like I might change up some cards. Like if I'm not playing Skullcrack and mm. Flames of the Blood Hand, maybe I'm playing those now. Skullcrack is one in a red. Deals three damage to an opponent. Uh, damage can't be prevented. Players can't gain life. And Flames of the Blood Hand is virtually the same thing, except it's three mana for four damage. It's interesting you mentioned those cards because uh, at one point I had a, I think it was um, Gruel Aggro, and I had a suite of anti life gain cards and a suite of anti artifact cards that I would sort of like move in and out. Depending on what you think was going to happen. Like, yeah. You know, cut my flames, cut this, yeah. like add. Uh, Destructive Revelry and like uh, Smash to Smithereens, stuff yeah. like that. And that that's a great example of, of how you can meta game. I, I have a I have a extension question for you, Jared. What if you knew you were playing Reanimator all four matches, <laughs> playing Burn? If I knew I was playing Reanimator all four matches, drop. We were like super insistent on playing Burn. That was your jam. Oh, then, I, I was actually going to say that you're allowed to audible if you want, basically. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I would want to change decks. All right. I would. I would. If I still had to play an aggro deck, I would play White Weenie. And the reason Ooh. I would do that is because you have more relevant disruption in the forms of creatures, like Thalia is really good. Both Thalias are really good, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Imposing Sovereign, Kinjali Sunwing are really good. So when they bring in their big creature, you just have a way kind of around it? Yeah. Even yeah, yeah, Mind Sensor. Containment Priest is like... <laughs> The stone unbeatable. Stone cold nuts in that matchup. Yeah. Imposing Sovereign's really annoying against and, like, the sneak attack and, effects. And you <laughs> also have Caracas, which is the best utility land in the matchup. Yeah, like, Caracas so, is so nuts. Like, it doesn't hit everything, but so many of the, the targets are legendary, so being able to just tap a land to send their, send their two cards worth of eight mana spell back to their hand that they're never casting is <laughs> is real great. Well, that brings up a uh, an excellent segue into our next segment. We've talked a lot about how you tweak um, a, a deck that you want to play against a certain matchup, and there's an important part of metagaming, which is bringing a completely different deck, of trying to read what the tournament is going to be and bringing the deck that you think beats it. And a lot of the speculation that we had for the uh, Canadian Top 8 final was what decks do we think people are going to bring? Yep. Um, there's some people that you know are always going to be on a thing, and there's some decks you always expect to be in the room. Yeah. So is your matchup tweaking your own deck, or is it bringing a completely different deck? This is also an option that <laughs> may or may not be an open avenue to, to you, depending on what your collection is like. Because people like us who've been collecting for ages and can build more or less anything we want have the option to play a completely different deck but it's, it may not be something that you're able to do if you're focusing really really hard on just one deck yeah and 
I mean, one thing you can do, even if you are focusing really hard on one deck, is you don't have to build like a totally different deck, but you can pivot the game plan of your deck like somewhat considerably and still keep like 60% but change out like 40 cards, right? What we were talking about before is like, yeah, you know, Alex is going to slide out three cards for three cards or yeah, I'm going to make five cards of a change. But but sometimes, I mean, if you're doing it on a budget, but you really can't win that matchup, sometimes it is 40 cards out, 40 cards in, you go from being an aggressive deck to a mid-range deck or from a mid-range deck to an aggressive deck. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's sometimes going to be necessary. Speed up or slow down. Yeah. Um, if if you do have a big enough connect collection to switch decks, it's really fun. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good time, and, and I think that that's definitely another way that you can approach the you can approach sort of meta gaming is rather than trying to tune the one deck that you have to beat the, the to beat the meta game, you can just try and find the deck that you think has the best matchups against the field, um, and I I think that um, ultimately both of these plans have a lot of merit. Totally. Um, and you can be very successful doing doing either one. I mean, that's kind of the same across a lot of formats of Magic, is that you can play the best deck in the format or the deck that beats that deck. <laughs> the rogue deck. The, the, well, the good formats, at least. Yeah. Yeah. This leads to an interesting little segment, which is uh, Serge Asks the Room. Great. Where uh, I am going to propose... Uh, I'm going to start with a theme and give you guys a challenge on how you're going to metagame against it. So I'm going to start with my nemesis. <laughs> Blue Moon. So all of you are going to have to have... Sell your collection, go home. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. So all of you are going to have to come up with a way uh, to beat Blue Moon. Okay. So Liam, um, you don't have a deck right now. You know it's a Blue Moon dominated meta. What deck are you bringing? Um, if, it sort of depends on exactly how Blue Moon dominated it is. But if I know I'm playing, you know Blue you're going to play him at least once. At least once. Yeah. Um, I want to bring uh, a deck that is really good against Blue Moon, but also fine against the rest of the field. That's also trying to bring beat Blue Moon. So I, I ah. think I would bring uh, the green white sort of aggro mid range. Um, this is and a deck so that, why? Yeah. So so Jer played this deck a bunch last year when when Blue Moon <clears throat> was was really good. Um, the white threats are very good against Blue Moon, and also the Armageddons and uh, Ravages of War are knockout punch cards against against them. Um, the moons don't affect you too badly. You have some utility lands, but if they're on the Blood Moon you plan, they're likely losing. Um, hmm. And then well, a lot of the creatures you have uh, are just bigger than their red removal. And then finally, you have a lot of quality answers to Platinum Empyrean. Yeah, hmm. I was also going to say, like, you incidentally have a bunch of creatures that can't be countered. Som yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, and and. You're just going to be threat dense enough to that. Like uh, Blue Moon does not have infinity counters. For those of you who are struggling <laughs> to play against it, just jam your stuff. Just, yeah, you, make him have it. You'd be shocked how many times your Blue Moon opponent is just like sitting there with not actually a whole lot of interaction. You got to make them have, yeah. have the perfect. Yeah. yeah, if you give them time to just sit there and sculpt their hand. Yeah, yeah. lots of times they're the just wheel spinning. But you are right, like Loxodon Smiter and Throne the Last Roller are great includes in this deck that sometimes are also maybe even um, uh, the, the, the Cat Snake. Cat snake. Prowling Sarpapard. Yes. Yeah. Serpapod. Serpapard. That one's a little worse, especially when compared with Smiter and Thrun, just because the three toughness mm. makes it way easier for them yeah. to deal with the red removal. What what can also happen with the green white deck, and, and part of the reason why you don't need to care about counters that much, is that oftentimes you end up sort of out ahead of the blue moon deck, and they're forced to uh, kill your stuff. And when they're killing your stuff, they're tapping out a bunch of the removal sorcery speed. And so you just are constantly going to find windows to revolve more and, and more and more stuff. All right, Alex, you're on your latest Aristocrats brew. <laughs> so you're three, maybe even four colors, and you know you're going to be placing. You're, you're going you're to be playing Blood Moon. How do you beat it? I don't. Okay. Um, I think that like, are you talking about like specifically the card Blood Moon? Oh, sorry, Blue Moon. You're against the Blue okay, Moon. Okay, because I was going to yeah. say if if you mean the card Blue Moon, I just lose to it. Yeah, Blood Moon. Hey, yeah. Like. Uh, Blood Moon back to basics. Uh, it is an occupational hazard for a four-color deck, and there's nothing that I really can or would even want to do for it. Ah, now like, why is that? Well, I could start adding in basics, and then it's harder to cast all my stuff. The mana in that deck's the, so hard. It's as very it is. difficult. Like you're, you have to play all the good duels, all the like fetches, um, a bunch of rainbow lands. And it's just like, it's not worth it to start jamming in basics to try and play around Blood Moon. Um, it's just something that you lose to. But for the rest of it, um, I'm trying to think. 
I feel like I probably have some outs to Platinum Empyrean that I can play. Because I have, the deck's kind of toolkitty. Uh, so, because I play both um, recruiters. So you can get stuff, what? You said tool, tool kitty, kitty, and I imagined yeah. a, a kitten that was really into tool. And, <laughs> look, I haven't that's slept a, much all right. <laughs> that's, since yesterday. That's pretty and, weird. Yeah. It's a good visual. Just like little kitten head banging, you yeah. know. Just I'm like, here with you. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> vibing out. No, now that's what I'm thinking about. All right. All right. Um, I was thinking about, like, um, uh, what's that human? It's a 2-2, two -two and it's, it shatters when it comes into play. Manic Vandal? Yeah, Manic, Manic Vandal. Vandal. Three mana, two, two. Yeah, you can play stuff like that. Palace Jailer. Pal uh, Palace oh, Jailer, yeah. which I have main board anyway. Yeah. Um, the Chupacabra. Chupacabra. Uh, it's interesting because the, um, Aristocrats, I don't know that it necessarily really even cares about the removal that uh, Blue Moon plays. That's, I don't think so. That's part that's of the, the advantage. That's part of why it's good because like, you play all these, these uh, creatures that leave something behind or have two bodies or just like come back. And it's like, sure, drop a thing that explodes all my stuff. Like, I dare you. I don't care. So yeah. you're interesting. So so Liam has gone with a strategy to try and directly counter it. Half of your deck blanks their strategy, and then the other half, half of your deck just folds it. hard. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's a little bit of luck <clears throat> and variance there. To, to just come back to me really quickly, yeah. um, I could, uh, part of the reason I wanted to play Green White as well is I could say, yeah, I'll play Seinfeld. <laughs> Seinfeld can never lose to Blue Moon. You counter, yeah. there are 11 threats, and then they die. Well, um, but here's the problem. My point. No, it's okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the problem with Seinfeld is that it's going to lose to the other decks trying to beat Blue Moon, um, like Green White. It's very bad against uh, Green White. So Green White is a better deck to bring into that metagame because it's a little more uh, even against the rest of the field as well, in particular other decks trying to beat Blue hmm. Moon. If I was going to, if I, if you told me, you're playing Blue Moon four times. Yeah, absolutely. I, <laughs> I want to bring Mono Blue Control, sign me yeah. up for like High Tide, something like that. Sure. But, but that, I just wanted to mention that really quick. Sure. Well, I was going to say, Jer, you're playing Control, but that got taken away. <laughs> so, Jer, you're on combo. And you know you're going okay. up against Blue Moon. What do you do? Which combo deck? Uh, it, Storm. It, Storm or High Tide. One of the, the all-in combo decks, not an A plus B combo deck. Those, those are different. I, I, I'm going to choose High Tide because okay. that's, that's the one I'm better known for. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you don't really have to do much. Your your matchup's great. The Blood Moons are, like, kind of annoying, but you can mostly just ignore them. High, high Tide is at its best against other control decks. And why Just because you blank all their removal, because uh, your creatures don't matter. Um, do you even have creatures that you have? Trinket Mage and, like, you have, Rift of you have some You have some untappers. Uh, yeah, that card's the stone nuts. Yeah, oh, I, I know. I just... You have Palancron, Peregrine Drake, Cloud of Fairies. I'm not on Great Whale, but... But you can be. You, you can be. Um, you own Treachery? It's, de it's defensible. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah that's, how you, that's how you deal with their Platinum Imperium. Because, like, mine it now... Yours. It also <laughs> doesn't... Yeah. Like, they, the you have a million Imperium bounce spells. doesn't save them from drawing cards until they die. Yeah, you just blue sun them for a thousand. Just like but, Cool Imperium. But your, your deck is just threat dense with... with you're dense with counter spells and draw spells, right. and they have counter spells, draw spells, creatures, and removal, two of which don't matter. Because their their creatures aren't fast mm. enough to kill you. So I'm grouping planeswalkers in with creatures. Like their threats just aren't fast enough to kill you. Like if if Inferno Titan is beating a high tide player, see so either they either messed up or Jer. like they were just never <laughs> winning the game. Have you have you killed them on high tide with Inferno Titan? Oh, other way around. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh well, wow. That story's there, been told there is on a this podcast. There was podcast. a pyroblast involved. That was some shit. Literally on this there. podcast. Wow. So the circle of I was just thinking of like yeah, hypothetical I'd... situations where the high tide player loses an unwinnable yeah, game. Like, what I a, it, what I a joke. <laughs> <laughs> just like that person was, should probably. That was actually play. fully unintentional. <laughs> Unintentional shade being thrown. Excuse uh, me while I slide out of my chair. Yeah. Oh, goodbye. Um, Into the but yeah. but like high high tide is just like designed to beat the sl the slow control decks. If you knew you were playing against a lot of blue moon, like three or four three or four times a night, would you consider like putting a, a few more anti blue cards in your deck? Uh yeah, like I'd probably put flusterstorm in the deck. That's a card that's mm. been in and out of. My versions, which is a really good defensive counter spell, especially mm -hmm. with the draw sevens, which can be li like liabilities against the blue decks, giving them a Ooh, fresh yeah. seven. And also, when you high tide, it's symmetrical, so oftentimes yeah. they get a lot of mana. Mm. E exactly. So here's an interesting question: um, What is your counter spell suite on Blue Moon versus you know more control versus less control? Do you change them much? In in high tide? Yeah. 
if it's really blue heavy, yeah, it will change. You'll you'll cut some of the answers for creatures for more for more counter spells. Like uh, you'll you'll always play engulf the shore. That's the best answer to creatures. High tide has. No, I don't actually know that card. What, what is it? This card, card was such a gift. Th three and a blue for an instant. Return all creatures to their owner's hands with less toughness than the number of islands you control. Whoa! Yeah, this card's really good. Uh, we don't high have tide. Overwhelming wave anymore. High tide wow. is want to play lots of islands. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Holy um, crap! God, so it's just it, it's just return creatures with toughness less than the number of lands you control. Oh, dude, check out that flavor text. The tide has begun to ignore the moon. There's a... Oh my god. There's a thing. All right, you have to play thing. this in your deck. Uh, blue High tide versus blue moon cause for that flavor text. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sold. <laughs> It's, it's not good. It might in the not be up. very good, but the flavor text. No, it's maybe so your good. opponent will concede. You can be like, "Can we switch to a flavor game?" Then they'll call a judge. No, you, then you'll get a game loss. <laughs> All right, <laughs> this, this plan is less good. You're gonna have eight islands, and you're gonna do this to their Imperium. <laughs> you just have nine. better answers. Don't. All right. So now less I'm, than or equal. I'm gonna turn this question around because obviously oh, I'm always hating on on Blue Moon because it preys on me. I take it personal. That 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 deck is. It just poops in your cereal. All right, Serge, your plan, Abzan mid-range lands against Blue Moon. Okay. Uh, you're going to be playing against at least two Blue Moon players tonight. Okay. How, how are you changing your deck up? I'm playing Choke. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> They're going to take my lands away. I'm going to take their lands right. away. Serge just wants to fight fire with fire. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Or... They you... invocationed Choke? They did, yeah. <laughs> it's actually kind of cool What the looking. hell? <laughs> oh, it turned into blood. That's correct. Yeah, because yeah, that's the blood moon from the, the the blue moon player and all their things going away. Um, so the the rivers the, ran red with blood briefly. So in this Abzan list, um, some of the answers I'm playing, I'm not diluting the strategy all that much, but I'm probably trying to mulligan to my answers more specifically. Uh, I'm probably going to lean on my crop rotation to try and get effects like uh, Bajuka Bog, because I know they, they really want to use Delve Spells to try and generate card advantage. So I'm going to try and hold that up to try and get a chance to get in there. Um, if, I'm in, uh, if I'm in white, I'm going to be hoping to use my Aven Mind Sensor to catch them when they're trying to do something. And with green, I'm going to really hope to lean on my Disenchant effects. Mm. Um, I might even be playing Nature's Claim. Um, so if you're in a prison style strategy where you don't really care about life total because you're not racing, Nature's Claim is a one mana green instant spell that says destroy target artifact or enchantment. You're like the person who controls that 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 gains thingy's four life. controller gains four life. Uh, and you'll see this in Infect sometimes, but this is a great card if there's something that's hosing your strategy and you have to get out of the way and you don't care because you'll get there eventually. Or, How do you feel about Crosan Grip? Cro oh. I used to play Crosan Grip, so Crosan Grip is a three mana instant spell for two and a green that says destroy target artifact or enchantment, but it has split second, which means they can't cast spells or activate abilities in response. So it just happens. Un uncounterable. Yeah, so... Uh, Triggered I, abilities still happen. Yeah, I want to say, as, as a judge, I, I don't want to say that you can't take any response to this because that's not true. And a lot of the calls I get are often people trying to tell their opponent that they can't respond to it, and that's not correct. I have countered this spell. Exactly. Wait, what? Because if you have... Um, um, what's counterbalance. Counterbalance in play. So counterbalance is a blue-blue enchantment that says whenever your opponent casts a spell, reveal the top card of your library, look at the converted mana cost of that card. If it matches the converted mana cost of the spell in the stack, counter it. How? Those Wily Miracles players always leaving their threes on top Absolutely. against the lands player with their, a bunch of these ones. Wow. With their yeah. pro sangle. Uh, secondly, I had a judge call at a tournament once where somebody was playing, um, what is the three mana? It's, uh, it's the, the Black Lotus, except you can suspend it. And Lotus Bloom. Lotus Bloom. So Lotus Bloom is a, it doesn't have a converted mana cost. You have to suspend it, but then you can sacrifice it for three once the suspend is off. And so the player was playing a combo deck, Lotus Bloom was there, they're getting ready to go off that turn, and the opponent was like, Crow Sand Grip, destroy your Lotus Bloom. You can sacrifice it in response because it's, an, it's, a, mana it's a mana ability. And that's not one of the things that's countered. I don't think you can. Isn't that a mana ability? Judge? Yeah, I don't think you can activate mana abilities in response to... You totally can. Can you? Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah, because again, split second the is just the can't spell spells or activate oh, abilities. That man the reminder oh, text yeah. on split second. Yeah, as long as the spells on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate Touché. abilities. So that, huh, that's that the abilities. thing. Like split second actually invites a lot of room for counterplay. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, yeah, I just, as, as a judge, I, I find it, I've run into so many cases where people misrepresenting that card. I took us on a massive tangent. Wow. My you apologies. Did. How do I feel about Crow's Hand Grip? If you asked me four years ago, I'd say that was an auto-include. Now I'd much rather play Reclamation Sage. And again, or I, I meant it in terms of, uh, in, in this specific matchup? In, in terms of nature's claim, like, it sort of does a similar thing. It's slightly less mana efficient, but... It's I'm wondering how you value mana efficiency like against Blue Moon I do. versus so in, the uncounterability. So specifically in, in Blue Moon, um, I'm less worried about the uncounterability because what I what how would I feel that Blue Moon wins is often in choking your resources, and I need that mana efficiency. And if they're I might be able to bait out the counterspell in their hand with something like my Crucible of Worlds or my Ramanap Excavator, mm. something that's going to let me gain advantage over that, and they'll counter it, and then with the extra mana, I'll be able to sneak in the Disenchant, the, the disenfa disenchant effect off the Nature's Claim, hmm. whereas the I just think there's too much of an opportunity cost with a three mana spell on that one, so that's how I would go back and forth with those two things. Fair enough. Well, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. All right. All right. I think we got time for one more example here. Okay. So let us defend Blue Moon. In this circumstance, you're all Blue Moon players. Great. Oh no, what's happening to Yeah, me? yeah, because uh, I might win I, a tournament finally. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. How many did you win last year? <laughs> I said I might win a tournament finally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought you, oh, I thought you were no, daggering no, Alex. No, no, no. no Dude, no, I thought no, you just no. roasted me on no, the podcast. No, no, no. I was roasting myself. Okay. Okay. I I'll, also I'll take back won my zero tournaments then. last year. God. Yeah. Team Team okay. Zero here. Yeah. Jar won more single handedly than like, all of us combined. Dude. <laughs> Did I poop right. in your cereal? <laughs> we'll find out. All right. Liam, I haven't eaten my cereal yet. you are playing Blue Moon, Perfect. and you know you're coming up against an aggro heavy meta. Yeah. What do you do? Um. Blue Moon's already reasonably set, well set up. It sort of depends on what kind of aggro. So if it's a lot of mono red, um, I'm potentially switching up my points a little bit. Maybe, oh, okay. maybe looking to include more ways to find um, Madcap Experiment as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, Mystical. Well, so I might I might lean towards not playing Ancestral Recall and instead playing the the spread that we saw uh, Stefan play at the the Highlander Championships, what which was, was that? Uh, I drew. So it was Dig Through Time, Treasure Cruise. Personal Tutor, Mystical Tutor, Merchant Scroll, Mana Drain, True Name Nemesis. Is that nine? Eight. That's eight? Crap. Uh, it's mystical tutor? Gifts are given. Gifts oh, are given wow. was the eight, ninth and tenth. So it's a bunch of small points. It's way better at finding Madcap Experiment. Okay. So uh, if I know I'm playing against especially a lot of Mono Red, I want Madcap on turn four every game. Um, that's that's my best path to victory in that matchup. Uh, I need to put Platinum Imperium as quickly as in quick, in, to play as quick as possible. Uh, also, True Night Nemesis is gas in those matchups as yeah. well. Yeah. It's, it's very good at stonewalling. If I'm playing against like green red or mono white, uh, it actually changes a lot. So if if I'm playing against green red. I need to probably put a little bit more removal in my deck because the Madcap Experiment is a lot less safe against a deck with a bunch of shatters. So many shatters. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. So it's still a reasonable plan, but I need to be able to probably set it up with Counterspell Backup to protect it. And then if I'm playing against Mono White, I actually want to um, dis, uh, dis uh, de-emphasize the Madcap Experiment plan because Mono White deck is very, very good at killing Platinum Imperium, Path Exile, and Swords of Plowshares, yep. uh, along with they have Disenchants as well. Council's, uh, Council's Judgment, Judgment Palace, Jailer. Palace Jailer. There's just there's so a whole many slew of cards that are great okay. answers. And so instead, I'm, I, if I knew I was going to play against multiple Mono White decks, I might even lean towards um, putting actual sweepers back into my deck. Yeah. So, uh, Pyroclasm? Right, yeah. Pyroclasm is a card that gets in and out. Um, Sweltering Suns is a card that would get yeah. Against in and out, I would get both of these cards back in. Um, Bonfire of the Damned is a card that never leaves, and and I would make I potentially would also Sudden switch demise. to right switch to a point spread that emphasized getting that quickly and and on time. Sudden demise is another good example. Doesn't yeah. that deck always play um, subterranean tremors? It does. Um, for the most part, but uh, I have seen people cutting some of them. Hmm. Um, Sudden Demise certainly is not in every list, and and so if you knew you were going to play against a lot of aggro, getting more of these sweepers into your deck seems like a, a reasonable thing to do. And in terms of what I would cut, um, you can probably afford to get rid of maybe a few of the 
um, more value oriented cards. So maybe you can cut a, a planeswalker, like a, a Chandra Torch of Defiance. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Some, something that's geared towards beating the mid range or control matchups. Um, and instead, yeah, re lower your curve a bit. Uh, put in I more might, removal. I might even cut a card like Back to Basics. To be honest, uh, yeah. that, that card's definitely not an auto include all the time. There are meta games where um, Back to Basics hurts you more than it hurts your opponent. It, it's actually true. Blue Moon likes likes having all its lands on tap. Yeah, totally. doesn't mind having the be, be mountains, but being choked on mana matters a bunch. So those are the kinds of cards I would look to remove. And yeah, I'd want to get some sweepers in. All right, Alex, you're Blue Moon, and you're expecting to face a lot of mid range. How do you beat mid-range? I don't know. <laughs> I don't play blue all that often, so I'm probably going to need help with this one. Yeah? So we can open it up to the room. Let me think. Mid-range. They're winning with, like, really efficient creatures. They play a couple of key counter spells. Um, yeah, if you're against, like, Jeskai mid-range. So, you know, they're playing Mantis Rider. Yeah. Uh, they're this playing the five... really interesting. Yeah, they're playing the five mana dragons. Is it more... Is more spot removal correct? Or is that bad? I think that's like a reasonable place to start, yeah. Like the, because the sweepers are not so good because... Yeah, they're going to develop what? stuff. They're, they're often going to sequence their threats one by one to not get blown out by sweepers. Yeah. And also a lot of their threats just are, are too, too big, big for yeah. the sweepers. Yeah, like it, your sweepers aren't going to do anything against the dragons. And lightning they'll, angel too. They'll buy you time against um, Brimaz. But still won't remove still, the Brimaz, yeah, yeah. which is the real the problem. problem. Yeah, so like a, a change you could make is you could slide out uh, sudden demise if it was in your deck, or, or slide out subterranean tremors, and instead get in a card like roast. Uh, just yeah, a nice catch all that kills har everything. Harvest pyre. Harvest pyre is great too. Yeah. I think in that case, because you're against a three color deck, you might be trying to prioritize getting your blood moon or back to basics out really quickly, because uh, that's the sort of thing you might be able to bait them into tapping out for five drop. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then counter that spell next turn, resolve back to basics, and then just GG. At, yeah. at, at least in the case of Jeskai, they play about six or seven basics these days. Um, so they can operate under Blood Moon, and if they're the Dragon's version, um, oftentimes the Blood Moon isn't like totally, totally no, devastating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but <clears throat> I agree with you that in terms of your mulliganing game plan, that card's definitely going to be a big part of it, but I don't think I would go as far as to like put Drift of Phantasms in my deck to, <laughs> to cheer yeah. for it. That's a little dirty. Have you ever... Uh, on on the opposite end, when you're ever playing against Blood Moon, have you ever pathed your own dude to get a basic oh. just to try and get around it? <laughs> many, many. Yes. Moons yeah. Ago. And you're sitting there, you're holding this path to exile, and you're like, if they cast Madcap Experiment, and you're I use my path, it. I'm like, yeah. I'm kind of hosed. Have you ever had them remand their Blood Moon after path after you path your own creature? Whoa. <laughs> Why? Because then you path your own creature, and they I, get to draw a card. I guess so. <laughs> huh. That would feel. I wonder how I'd feel about that. You know, like that would be really weird. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you can do against it? Like you play more counter spells than mid range. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you you're already pretty okay there. Would you add some to make sure that that's okay, or you just? Uh, I think you're okay. The, the one other thing that I like doing against mid range is putting uh, bigger, badder threats mm -hmm. in the deck. Mm -hmm. um, so potentially getting a card like Karanos. Frost. Karanos is good, and or like Frost Titan, uh, a oh, card yeah. that's very hard oh, to yeah. interact with and kills people very fast. Yeah. is another card that I would well, like, that I would consider getting. Would you in. get Inferno Titan there? Uh, yeah, it's, for sure. Yeah, it, Inferno Titan's a, a card that often sees play in the deck, and I would certainly not cut it for this matchup. No. Karanos is sweet. Karanos is actually a card that's not in the stock Blue Moon list. Not, Interesting. not really. Uh, not, for, not for a while, but if you knew you were playing against a bunch of mid-range, there's a card you, you want to get back time. Just yeah. generates so much advantage. It's and really like, insane. They have, like, one out to this? It's, uh, council, it's like that's Council's true. Judgment. Yeah, depending on what they what colors they, they can are. Can I, they can also bounce it with... Cryptic command. Yeah, yeah, that's target permanent or whatever. Just tap if they're playing tap forsake for four worldly, they can also forsake it, which is kind of hot. Yeah. Hmm. All right, and then just because of our twist, your blue moon in the blue moon mirror. Oh no! How do you tap? Everybody's blue on blue moon. I Everybody's mean. on blue moon. Uh, so you cut all the moons from your deck, <laughs> <laughs> and then you just become blue red control. Yeah. Okay. The, this is often what I do, is, yeah. except I take out all the red cards and put in white cards. <laughs> uh, Transformative. That, that's one of the the ways I beat Blue Moon is with blue white control. So, but for for the sake of argument, I'll, I'll no, no, stay no, I like that. Red. We have the idea: bring a different deck. Yeah, you like it's, if it's like you have the same core blue cards, yeah. but instead <clears throat> you just have white cards, which are better against the aggro decks and better in the mirror because like Blue Moon is never going to have enough burn to 
burn out another blue deck. This okay. is not how they're built, and they're playing. If they're adding more more red cards, they're cards like Roast and Harvest Pyre that don't go don't go upstairs. Yeah. So they have like maybe twelve points of burn in their deck, not mm -hmm. counting Bonfire of the Damned. <laughs> you I'm, clearly haven't played against my Price of Progress Blue Moon build yet. I, I have not. That seems bold and ambitious. Price and Snapcast that, of Progress. Many people have I described have, me as I bold have, and ambitious. I there. applaud your efforts. I'm glad you the club. <laughs> I, I see if you mentioned um, uh, Harvest Pyre a couple of times. I'm actually surprised to hear that because I don't think I've ever seen that card cast in Highlander. Let's talk about what's Harvest Pyre. Uh, so Harvest Pyre is a instant for one and a red as an additional cost to cast Harvest Pyre. Exile X cards from your graveyard. Harvest Pyre deals X damage to target creature. So one of the problems with playing just blue-red mm -hmm. is you're stuck with red removal. <laughs> Boy, does red removal suck. Not, it's very efficient, often costs very little, but the problem is it's... Well, it's, the ceiling is super low. Exactly. The, like, most red removal stops at four damage. Yeah. That's like the upper end. Most of it's three damage. By the way, why is this card not called The Wicker Man? <laughs> So That's what, another card. Not the bees. What happens when your opponent plays an X4, or God forbid, an X5? You can't, yeah. you, you five can't toughness beat creature. five toughness. E exactly. You then three cards. That, that scoop number up. is stone unbeatable. I think five. you meant the ceiling is high? No, no, no. The ceiling is low because it bumps what, into it. What ceiling? The, 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 ceiling, on, the ceiling of damage. damage. The number of damage. So say, say like, it's it's a scale. Yeah. And, and the Y... Or the ceiling graph. is the highest theoretical. Yes, and it's yeah, low. It's, it doesn't. The all, ceiling all your, is low, your, so it only goes so high. Here's, the here's where you want to be. And this does is five. Yeah. As opposed to. I thought you meant the ceiling on this card was low, and no, I'm like, no, the, no, ceiling no, no. This card is, no, the ceiling on this card is. That's, insane. that's why you play this card because it, yeah. it blows well, through the ceiling. Yeah. Okay. You can appreciate my confusion. There we go. Yeah. So you sacked all your land, so you put your whole deck in there, now you can 99. Yeah, so the reason you play Harvest Pyre is as an out to big creatures. Yep. which like Platinum Imperium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, if they resolve Madcap in the mirror, it can be tough to beat. I really want to play this with Boros Reckoner now. I want to play Shiv and Meteor. That's, one, that's <laughs> my out. I made a deck like that once and it was real bad. All right. But it was you. so sweet. All right. So let's, let's wrap it up here. Uh, any closing remarks on, on how to metagames. So we talked about reading the room, trying to understand what to bring, how to change your own deck. Oh, even before that, we defined what metagaming was, yeah. different types of hate cards, what to bring, not to dilute your strategy, bring a different deck. I, like, we covered a lot here. Any, yeah. any closing remarks? Yeah. Be involved with your community, just like... Keep, no, no. Keep you know what people are keep, playing. Keep, keep your finger on the pulse. Like, you know, look at what deck lists are getting played. You yeah. know, have a look at them, see what cards are there they have in there. Hard to metagame if you don't know the metagame. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually the... the key thing is like in order to metagame you need to know what the metagame you're metagaming for is <laughs> meta 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 game. meta 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 on it uh, I just had one other thing to say, yeah. actually. Um, just on the on the, the last note there where we were talking about mirror matches, um, mirror matches are the hardest ones to metaphor a lot of the time because at the end of the day you're you're often still playing sort of like 90 cards the same. And so um, Jira's approach of don't play the mirror match is actually oftentimes a better one. Like if you're getting frustrated with uh, losing to to the mirror, um, rather than trying to tech your deck to beat the mirror, it, it is oftentimes better to switch to a different deck. Um, and again, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you know full new hundred cards. But sure. like like Jer said, you you can pivot forty cards, cut all the moons from your deck, and become blue red control or blue red tempo or something else. Um, so if you're getting frustrated playing the mirror. Um, Oftentimes, teching for the mirror is pretty challenging, and just switching to a deck that's better against that deck is better. Cool. Better, better, better. All right, let us better. go Much to our better. closing segment, Powerful Magic. Ba -ba -ba <laughs> and up today, we have Liam. Liam, tell me a story of, of magic power. All right, yeah. this, uh, <laughs> this story is pretty good. I've, I've had a bunch of Powerful Magic story rec stories recently, but this is the oldest one in the old, okay. the old archive, the vault, as I like to call it. Uh, that's my, my brain, by the way, in case anyone was confused. Um, so I'm uh, playing against a uh, fellow local player, Shen. He's playing like Abzan, uh, kind of like mid-range aggro, a bunch of moxes, okay. comes up to like five kind of thing. I'm playing uh, Grixis Splinter Twin. I really like Hot. Splinter Twin yeah, people okay. like, yeah, okay. a lot. And it's game three. We've had two like pretty interesting games so far, and now it's game three. I won the last game. It's 1-1. One, one. Uh, Shen's on the play. And he like looks down at his hand, kind of smiles a little bit, and you know that's bad, right? That means that means the hand's good. He's a really reserved guy. He is. That's also true. Yeah, when the guy with the poker face just like, 
Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, and so he's got the nutter butter for sure. Yeah, and so uh, Shen goes land mocks cold steel heart named black. Um, uh huh. Yeah, uh, and I'm like, okay, my opponent's gonna untap with four mana potentially. That's probably bad for me. So I play my lowly island and I say go, and then he untaps and he, he plays a land and then he casts his siege rhino right on time. Oh, uh, siege rhino turn two. Yeah, it was a good time for that card. Wow. Uh, so I took some damage. Yeah. Uh, then for my next turn, I went land. I, I played a search for Ascanto, you know, just a nice little enchantment. You know, As one we were going to play a little value game. Totally fine. Uh, then my opponent, uh, he untapped and he attacked me with his siege rhino. <laughs> and then he played a lingering souls and flashed back the lingering souls after making his land drop. So, so he now has eight power on board and, okay. and I have 13. We Doran now. Uh, so then I scry with my search res canta, or I'd look at the top card. I bin it, it's no good. Um, and then I play my land and I pass to him and he uh, attacks me for eight and puts me down to five and then plays another lethal threat and taps out. And it's at this point that I reveal my trap card. Oh, my, trap, no. my trap card being, uh, I have pester in my hand. And so I <laughs> cast my Pestermite on his end step, and I could have cast it before combat to tap down the Siege Rhino to save damage, but I'd seen a lot of removal earlier on in the match, and I was oh, pretty sure he no. would have a removal spell in his hand, so I wanted him to tap out, and he did. Uh, he wanted to put lethal on board, didn't want to get, like, removal spelled out or Pestermite it mm -hmm. out. So I cast Pestermite, and <laughs> and looks at me, and he's like, do you have it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have two looks, um, and... Uh, or sorry, I have the Splinter Twin in my hand, but I don't have another red source. I only have one. Okay. And so uh, I have two looks at red source. So yeah, you get the scry off a of search for right. a scandal. Yeah. So I sort of like play this Pestermite, and then he's like, uh huh. And then I like reveal this Splinter Twin from my hand, and he's like, oh, am I dead? And I'm like, and then I reveal the rest of my hand, which contains no lands. Um, and then I go, scry off of search for Escanta. It's not a land. I put it in the bin. And then I flip the top card of my deck, and it's Cascade Bluffs, and I kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> got, to, wow. got to weasel my way out of that game that I had no wow. business winning. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, make him have it. I, I, I was yeah. drawn live. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rules of USC apply in Highlander. Never tap out. <laughs> I... I would, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Protect yourself. That's uh, a different. That's a different episode. Yeah. When All right. tap out. Well, that is our episode for the day. Thank you so much. Hopefully, uh, everyone watching enjoyed learning about metagaming or how to metagame. Uh, I know we enjoyed talking about it. We did. Uh, a reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you with your support over at the patreon.com slash loaning ready run. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. And from us to you, uh, thank you and goodbye. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>